So I have the pleasure of bringing together friends and colleagues who I think will um, really provide a neat discussion. And uh, the, this comes about on the back of a, of a previous uh, session that Dr. Ashuba Ramani put together that was very much on how we think about writing uh, for educational manuscripts. We wanted to bookend this idea of medical education research kind of being this theme to also have a frank discussion of how you really bring forth an idea uh, all the way then to a publication. We get this uh, question a lot uh, and, and we welcome it here in the BEI because so many people want to pursue this kind of path as a healthcare educator. And how do you do that? And how do you make it academic? Um, and so that's what we're goal, our goal here is today. Yeah, you know myself, I've done a brief introduction. I will um, introduce just briefly and then give them a chance to speak here upcoming our three panelists, um, three outstanding medical educators with widespread experience uh, in publishing and the field. Martin Pushik, um, Ed Krupat, and Christina DeZara. And then I also introduced you already to the BEI staff, as well as Dominique. So one <clears throat> slide on goals, and then we'll dig right into it. Um, again, the purpose of this is really to do two things. Uh, we went into this discussion acknowledging that most of the questions that we receive uh, surround two areas. The first is uh, trying to broaden the understanding that there's a real diversity of what can make up a scholarly product within the field of medical education. And so to showcase that a little bit, that not all projects have to always be alike, and yet they're all equally contributory in many ways. And the second kind of piece behind this discussion today is to make it very practical, to try and uh, take away a little bit the uncertainty of how you go from the beginning to the end. So we'll try and be open with that um, as we walk through three different articles a little bit uh, and the author's experiences, again, getting it from an idea to a publication. So we're not gonna get into writing styles or hypothesis generating. Those will be for other sessions and we welcome you to those. Uh, and this is really gonna be much more the practical discussion. So you see the structure outlined ahead. I'm gonna ask each of the authors um, to talk about the manuscript we chose to have them profile. And they'll get two minutes to do that. So you don't have to obviously have read this article in advance but you'll have some context for what they were trying to do. And then I'll lead a discussion that kind of gets from the beginning of the process to the middle of the process, and then hopefully the end and how it got published. In the meantime, as you have questions, please put them in the chat box once again, and then we'll take a break and try and answer those. So um, I had each of these um, colleagues send me two or three articles they've recently published, and then I was the one who chose the one I wanted them to kind of discuss. And I did it so that there was a real diversity amongst the three of them. So I'll introduce Ed, Ed Krupath, uh, and, uh, and if I can, Ed, Ed, ask you please to just describe in you know, two minutes or so what the idea was behind this manuscript and what you ultimately did and showed. Okay, uh, glad to be with you all. Uh, let me see if I can uh, get uh, 40 minutes into two. Um, back in about 2004, Maxine Papadakis published a series of very interesting studies indicate where she found people who had trouble with professionalism problems in practice, traced them back to medical school. Uh, you, and when you looked at these people compared to a set of matched controls, you found that lo and behold, they did have problems earlier. That was the idea. What's the relationship between early and late? Now, this was a widely cited study, but most often cited incorrectly, saying that students who have trouble in medical school will then have trouble in, in real life. And that is a prospective statement rather than something based on the retrospective study they did. So we said, let's see if we can do a prospective study of the same sort. The problem with any prospective study is that it takes 20, 30 years to do. And we decided to get really creative and say, well, what if we had this idea 20 years ago? Are there data that have been created in the last 20 years that we can look at? So what we did is with some funding from the same agency that funded uh, the original studies, we went back in time, identified people at Harvard Medical School and at Case Western, set up a set of matched controls on uh, gender and race in year of graduation, and looked at whether people had professionalism problems in medical school, and then did a survey 
asking people who were their residency directors if they recalled them in positive and negative ways. Lots more detail needed that way. And also at another point in time, looked at records uh, of the national, uh, of national records of um, whether in fact they had had uh, been sued for malpractice and or been sanctioned by a state board. Uh, it was a lot of work. It's probably the hardest study and most fascinating study that I've ever done. And it required uh, a bit of creativity. Wonderful. I'll stop there. And so really just this idea that there was a prospective idea that we could capture initial data on professionalism and then move it forward to understand what was the impact on that learner trainee down the line. I'm going to go uh, and move next to Martin. And uh, this one, Martin, a, systemic, a systematic review on learning curves. Maybe if you could just give a little background for how this came about, what you showed and wanted to study. Sure. Th thanks. And thanks for the opportunity. Um, we had done a, a bunch of studies looking at how people learn how to do visual diagnosis, x-rays, EKGs, photos, and that kind of stuff. And, and in doing those studies, we found that the, one of the good ways to report that is to use learning curves. How much do you learn over time and, and what's your path towards getting, getting good at the thing? And, um, and it took us a while to figure out how to do that and uh, the math around it and what's a good learning curve, what's a lousy one and the like. But, um, but gradually, you know, just little by little by little, learn more and more about them. And, um, and Neva Howard, who's the first author on this, uh, on this paper, came to us and said, I'm interested in the stuff that you're doing and, um, and can I play? And um, and Neve is a junior investigator, and um, and so so it was as much to get Neva a project and get Neva a publication and um, and and be able to move her forward in her career, while at the same time allowing our research program to be informed by a broader look at learning curves. And so, um, so I'm friends with David Cook and Rose Hadela. David's at the Mayo Clinic. Rose is at uh, the University of British Columbia. They had published a massively cited uh, systematic review in JAMA on technology-enhanced learning. And so they had this database already that they had slaved over over years and, um, and had uh, spreadsheets on a thousand articles then all sorts of details on it. And so, so those articles, some of them would have learning curves in them. And so what we did was they had already created the frame for the systematic review. So we could say this literature was searched and these articles were downloaded. And then of those articles, the ones that had learning curves, what were they like? And what made for a good learning curve? And so Neva had the energy, David Cook and Rose Hadela had the mentorship and the systematic review experience, and, and our, my group had um, learning curve experience, and so it all came together in a sense of you have this, uh, you, I have this, and Neva has the energy and interest to move it forward. And so, so we started in 2012, and this publication ended up being the, uh, the result of that. That's wonderful. And, I'm, and hold that thought for a sec, Martin. I'm just going to have Christina now. Um, uh, her, her article here, which is really a new novel kind of educational thing, a journal club. And Tina, tell us about the publication a little bit. Thank you. So in 2018, I actually taught two sections of healthcare research to undergraduate health sciences students at Northeastern. And this is a common requirement, but it's often taught in a didactic style. And that's actually misaligned with millennial learner values. They like guided learning, real world examples, active engagement, learning through doing, and psychological safety. And so I designed the course following principles that I learned in the Masters of Medical Education program at Harvard Medical School, curriculum design, adult learning theory, cognitive science. And I did it with a journal club style because I wanted to put the emphasis of the learning on the, on, the, on the learners themselves and each other doing through the use of a one page template. It helped the learners break down the articles. Then they presented their paper to their peers. Then the student and I would facilitate discussion about that article among all learners during every in-person class. And I put other unique elements such as peer review and the use of a plus delta in every single class session. Then I evaluated this as part of routine educational evaluation and quality improvement. I collected course evaluation data from three qualitative and quantitative sources, and this resulted in a convergent mixed methods educational evaluation. 
Wonderful. I'm going to stop sharing and now I'll put us all kind of on one screen. So um, this is where the fun of the discussion comes up. So now everyone kind of knows the background to three, I think, fascinating articles. And the, I think the first thing I'm going to pull on is kind of how the idea and the process took hold uh, and, and the diversity of that. And Christina, if I'm, I'm going to paraphrase here a little and just um, make sure I'm on track, but you had an educational idea, an initiative, something you were doing. It was a deliverable, a new journal club, if you will. And it was logical to you probably to say, well, not only am I going to work on the teaching and educational structure, but I'm going to study it so I can share it with others. Is that fair to say? I didn't initially know that I would plan to write this paper up, um, but the class went so well and I put so much effort into designing it. I mean, at the end, the students were like, I can't believe class is over. I'm going to miss this class so much. And since I had embedded so many um, adult learning theory elements and curricular design elements, I felt like I needed to report that in the literature and thankfully I had an opportunity to do so. And, and I want to just compare and contrast that a little bit, Martin, which is what you ex described so well, which is on some level, the pieces kind of fell together for your project. Is that fair to say? Yes, the pieces, the pieces kind of fell together, but um, th that's not to under uh, underplay how much work was involved. And so, yeah. that, uh, so I think um, I think what was good about it was we knew, you know, from the process that Rose and David had gone through, that even though we already had an installed data set, it meant going back to 112 papers, going through each and every one of those papers by two people and you know kind of a whole series of uh of pieces abstracted from that but uh but we also knew there was a reliable process you know that um yeah that at well, the end, I, and i think also not to underestimate sometimes you get an idea and then you have the light bulb go off to say we already have access to something that would have been a huge amount of work to put together and maybe we can exploit that for efficiency to utilize that as you know save time through the process um and it often i am my opinion on it is when you sometimes have data like that, there's often many ways you can use data like that. So to um, not let it just be used for one manuscript, but multiple projects can be really of value. But Ed, I'll bring it back to you now, which is um, your idea, it sounds like maybe had been percolating for a while, you know, ever since the Papadakis article had come out. How long did you percolate on it? How long did it take? <clears throat> it took a lot of years. Uh, the idea was, we always thought, how could we ever do it? And then in fact, and we never knew a source of funding. And then we found out that the uh, Stemler Fund of the National Board of Medical Examiners had funded Papadakis and a little light bulb went off and we said, well, why don't we apply to them as well? And we were shocked and pleasantly surprised that we got the resources to do this because it really did require a lot of resources. You know, and I bet I'm going to get a question in the chat, so I'm going to get ahead of it on, on resources. That's probably a big one. And so when you say resources, Ed, how did you, um, where did you need the money for, to, to pull off this or the resources, the time, et cetera, to pull off that project? Yeah, it, it didn't go to, to my salary, certainly. It went largely to a research assistant and for various things to pay that cost to, to get. Uh, for instance, uh, the uh, AMA has a database that you can buy, that, that you can uh, buy, and that costs several hundred bucks just right there. Um, it's just amazing. And then also, we were doing this at two campuses, and uh, we needed a person at both campuses to oversee all the gathering and coordination. Yeah. And uh, while we're on that, Christina, was there any unique funding you sought, or was it on your own time, if you will, while you were doing the teaching? Oh, this was absolutely on my own time. It was something that I was that I wanted to do. Um, I will say that I engaged a trainee in this process. My I, uh, first author was her. I senior authored this um, because I needed a second coder. I needed someone to help me out with the analysis and the literature review. And um, it was actually a capstone project, a senior graduation capstone for a student. And so that's how I got around the issue of funding. Um, and I have to say, to see a young person get their first publication is always a real joy. And Martin, funding on your end? Uh, no, there wasn't any funding for the uh, for the project, and even the massive um, JAMA systematic review that David Cook had done, they did with minimal to no funding. But 
you know, they, uh, it depends on how you count those things. So I think Ed's use of the word resources, some of the resources are funds that go to pay for a person over here. Some of them are your sweat equity that, uh, that you know, where you're investing in yourself, as, as Christina said, uh, a junior person sort of needing that first publication to establish credibility. And, um, and so the, the, these things end up being some complicated mix of, um, of resources that come from somewhere in different forms. Yeah, and I, and I think, again, I'll just reemphasize a little bit of maybe sounding like a broken record, but boy, there's really diversity there to how ideas came forth, right? Um, and then there are also ideas on how it kind of got activated to move forward. Uh, and I'll invite everyone now to, um, and Dominique will be monitoring, to, to think about some questions about just kind of launching. And while you do that, um, and before Dominique, I pull you in, um, and I'm just going to go back to you because you have the longest runway, perhaps, on getting this from idea to publication. You said it was quite a, quite a long trial. Uh, and the question to you is, did things change early on? Uh, was the original idea of where you were taking it really where you ended up? Or did you really have to steer it a little bit based on um, situations or opportunities or things like that? Well, in terms of the conceptualization, it really didn't change an awful lot. The National Board... Uh, the uh, the Stemler Fund insisted that we focus on people who had troubles professionally rather than troubles in, of general nature. So that's one thing that changed. But other than that, again, we had just no sense of the immensity of capturing data for 300 students uh, in records that existed in various places and following them up and where they were. Uh, Dominique, let me stop here and see uh, any questions that have come in so far from the group. Um, I don't have many, any questions now, but uh, it may be interesting commenting if they have a working routine or protected time to do research. That would be nice. Sure. Um, yeah, maybe you can speak a little bit, uh, Christina, talk about working in the BEI and kind of how this might fit into that effort. <laughs> it's I mean, your I boss think... on the line. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I, I think that all of us are uh, people who work really hard. And I think if you want to publish research papers, uh, especially if they're not 100% directly connected to your work, that you do have to be a hard worker. I mean, this was all done by squeezing in an hour here or there, or simply, you know, blocking off a Saturday and making it a point to write. It's, it's not always easy to find time to do these things, but it is satisfying. Yeah, and I think I'll just play off that because Christina and I work together here and um, as the lead for education science and initiatives, Christina is always out there doing things with our constituency and education, uh, training and learning and kind of next steps. And so um, it's not as though we carve out extra time to say half the time should be publishing this next research project. It instead is always saying, well, as part of that effort that you're doing, you should always take advantage of, of the world we live in. We live in an academic environment. And so take that extra hour or half hour and see if you can collect some data. And we may not always have the time to write it up right away, but at least we're starting the process. I think that's kind of the key. Um, good. Let me uh, keep us moving. It's, uh, it's always going to go by quick here. And I'm going to move us now into the second kind of section. So we, we, we moved from idea of launch and kind of getting started. We talked a little about funding. Let's talk to now like the meat of it. We, we're moving forward with the project and we're not yet at the writing or analysis section, but we just got to get the data done and see what we find. And um, the question that always is a nice one to lead with is kind of what came up kind of unexpected or, or expected or how did that go? Uh, and Martin, I'll kind of turn it over to you. <laughs> sure. You know, I think with research that if you know how the story is going to end at the time that you start, then you're not really, really doing research, right? You're doing a description of something that is well established. And, um, and so that I think that um, in, in our systematic review, you know, kind of we started off, we had a frame, we knew which articles we were going to go through and the like, but, um, but as we got into it, it became more and more interesting. And, and we had themes that we hadn't anticipated in terms of the way people lay out learning curves in our, in our particular example. And, um, and so 
that that was almost the funnest thing, but it also means that the, that the process is inherently inefficient. You can't plan that I'm going to get this much done and then this much done and this much done because all over the place are little rabbit holes that you fall into and explore and look around and try and figure out, you know, kind of what's what and is this important and, um, and is this something that I want to surface in the, in, the, in the progress as we go along. And I imagine some of those rabbit holes can be a little tangential at times and you have to decide whether you're going to follow that or not. Right? Exactly, exactly. Christina, how, um, how did the project go? Uh, expected, unexpected ideas or, or uh, reflections? Overall, I think it went pretty as expected. It was a two person team. So it was sort of my vision with the help of my trainee. Um, I will say the IRB was pretty easy. It went through. It was approved exempt. That's what I expected because the data are so low risk and they were collected as part of routine educational evaluation. The biggest challenge I faced was when I got that review back and I was like, oh, they want a lot of changes. They didn't think we effectively fleshed out our introduction and why this matters. Why would someone want to read this paper? That hurts when you hear that. <laughs> um, they wanted more information about our population of learners and they felt that there was some misalignment in our paper. And the biggest thing I had to learn is I originally presented this as a mixed methods educational evaluation, but they came back and said, you didn't integrate your data, Christina. You kind of did a quant and you kind of did a qual, but you're not reporting it in an integrated way. And it took me quite some time to bring the data together in a way that really told a story about the learner experience. And um, I will tell you, Eric, that I learned a lot about doing mixed methods research and it's a journey and I'm on it, but I feel like I learned a lot by doing that. But that when you get that review and you open it up, oh, it can hurt a little bit. Yeah. Well, I, and I think emphasizing what you said, Christine, is also useful for the audience here, which is um, you don't always have to only do research in what you feel most confident doing. Sometimes also pushing yourself to take advantage of that moment or a type of research that you haven't done a lot, but it also trains you uh, to do it again if you, if you take advantage of it, but it, you have to work through the ups and downs of learning while you're doing a little bit. Ed, um, you have again this the longer of the projects almost, and so I'm expecting there were kind of some complexities and ups and downs that you ran into. Maybe you can describe a few. Got a couple hours. Uh, <laughs> That's right. Take your time. Not only not only were we getting data. By the way, I I'm talking about the complexities of these, but not to discourage people, but to actually say that it's kind of challenging but fun when you can overcome these things. Our data not only came from multiple sources at multiple schools, but also you've got to realize that these were very sensitive data. We had the names of people at Harvard Medical School who had, let's say, been accused of cheating. And you can be awfully sure that the IRB and we want to make sure that this was protected. And uh, that, so that was complex. Um, and then we needed, again, cooperation of databases from national boards. We needed co-op. And then we wanted to do a survey of the residency directors where they had gone. But these are people who had gone from residency direct, been in residency 15 years ago. So we had to get the green book of the AMA to look up residencies and who was directing them and what their current addresses were. It was a wonderfully complex challenge of putting things together. But we had this sense of what we wanted and we had this sense that if we persisted at it, it would all fall together, which it did eventually. Speaking of uh, just two questions that are going to come back to both of you um, on this topic. One is going to be, how long did it actually take? That's what probably people want to know from when you kind of brought your authorship rough team together to when you finally got it published. Um, and why don't you actually go with that one, Ed? How long did it take? Uh, when, when we applied for it, one of the main critiques of the reviewers was that this was two years funding. You could never do it in two years. We assured them that we could. And 12 years later, you got to bear with this. we proposed this in 2013. We started collecting data in 2014. The publication is 2020. And the backup, was, question, the backup question, though, Ed, is... Um, through all that effort and data that you collected, this led to a very successful publication. 
Is there any other secondary publication that will come out of the data or effort as well? You know what, I, I will answer straightforwardly, I don't believe so. Uh, it, there was a very focused set of questions and very often good secondary questions come up for another paper, but this was a very self-defined issue. We came to uh, what we think is an interesting, satisfactory answer. And unlike most things that I do, there, were ne there was never a thing about, well, what else can we publish from it? Yep. And just for the sake of the audience, I'm gonna ask kind of the leading question, which is, it took you like, I don't know, you said nine years there or something, were you working on other educational efforts, academic projects during those nine years in conjunction with this? About 17 to All 40. right. And I, I, you know, I, I always like to pull that out because some projects have a very slow pace, but they end up with something really neat at the end and you need fillers that are a little quicker at times and the world kind of goes like that. So to have multiple projects is not always a bad thing. You often need that. Uh, Christina, back to you. How long was your project, kind of from inception to completion? Yeah, so I, I taught the course in September 20, 2018 to December 2018. I wrote the IRB in May of 2019, submitted it in June. It was approved in July 2018. Started working with my trainee from July, uh, no, July 2019 to March 2019. Um, and ultimately it was published uh, just a few months ago. So in total, it, it took about two full years from the day I started the course till the day that the paper got published. And for me, this feels pretty par for the course. I mean, even just getting something reviewed nowadays can be six months, so there's definitely a time lag. Do you think the data you've collected might lead to a secondary uh, next step or a new, a new piece of research or, um, or is it kind of one and done with what you collected? You know, I'm going to say for this particular paper, I don't. I don't have any additional data. I'm not teaching the course anymore. I will say that it can be helpful, even if you're doing a one-off paper, to think about how it aligns with your program of research and how you'll ultimately talk about yourself. I now have three publications, which actually I think um, possibly four, if things go well with a new submission, which point to the use of journal clubs in various ways in, uh, in undergraduate education as well as in um, graduate medical education. And so I think if you can at least have that as part of your body of evidence of what you're doing in the field, um, it's a positive thing. Yeah, and I, I think what you're also getting at is if you've had different journal clubs in different areas, the ideas kind of might come forth in uh, whenever, a year, five years, 10 years, to say maybe we could also do a comparative analysis of those different uh, groups, all with the same educational process. So you never know where one idea will take the next, but to keep your mind moving, I think is useful. Martin, how long did it take to get this one all the way Jeff, down? I just looked it up in my, um, on my hard drive and uh, May of 2012, I have a file that says outline for the systematic review. And, um, and so that, uh, so from 2012 to 2020. And what's tricky there is with a systematic review, you know, the, um, the, the literature search gets stale dated. Yeah. So we had uh, this thing where we wrote it up and then realized it was just been too long. So we had to redo the literature search to go at it again. And then the whole time it's under review, you're worried that the review is going to take, as Christina says, six months and therefore um, end up uh, end up stale dating the thing all over again. But if I could, the um, Danielle has raised an interesting point in, uh, in the chat box about, you know, kind of when uh, did you have projects that didn't get published, you know, sort of, uh, and... Um, um, and Eric has alluded to the idea of having projects that would lead to multiple uh, publications. And, and so what I would point out is, um, and, and Ed touched on it, is that often you have a portfolio or a pipeline. And in that pipeline, you have some things that are just a, a glint in your eye of a project that you'd like to do, leading all the way to response to reviewers for the umpteenth time on your eighth submission of this paper that has taken you eight years to to get to the to the front line and so so for those of you who are just starting out you've just got one phase you know kind of the the first phase of a, of a publication but when you get 10 years out or 15 years out you're gonna have this portfolio and in that portfolio should be some projects that you started and that didn't work 
Because if you don't have any that didn't work, it means you're not taking risks. And again, you're not um, exploring areas where you could fail. And, and so, that, um, so I think that uh, a holistic idea of what your portfolio looks like and, and who you are from, uh, from a scholarly standpoint uh, does get reflected in your portfolio of publications. Absolutely. Dominique, let's uh, pull you in and I see that a lot of chat comments. I haven't looked at them in detail here as I'm moderating, but uh, any other thoughts, questions, comments that we can bring to our panel? Um, I think every, everything was um, talked already. We, there are comments about yeah, ideas, if they, how many make it to publication and how when to abandon them. So I think that was already touched. And we were also discussing about systematic reviews and that you have to be really quick in order to publish them. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, it, it looks like there is a question about choosing a journal and the process of submission. Ah, let's, let's bring us to kind of our part three and then we'll kind of see where this goes. So we had this great idea that started somewhere in 2012 for at least two of you um, and has moved forward. And then there was the fun of kind of keeping it going. And I would argue probably the fun and the complexity because it will come with stops and starts but you made it to the end, right? Where the data were kind of complete now and you were beginning to analyze it. Um, how did you begin to write it up, Martin? And I guess the angle I wanna just bring forth is, you were the last author, the senior author, and we're gonna compare this um, to also a smaller authorship in uh, Christina, where it was just two of you, I believe. But uh, how did that work? Did you give the go to your first author to say you should start writing now or did you work on an outline or what's the back and forth? There? Well, there, there is quite a back and forth and I think it depends on the nature of the team. And so often the first author should be a trainee that or a mentee that you're bringing along in the, in the field and a person who's, who wants to get in depth into what in this case a learning curve is and what the literature is like. And so that, um, and yet it's the senior author's job on the team to then, you know, kind of guide and, and to say, you know, here's where to look and here are the here are the people who've written well on this and so so I think uh, but there will be other other structures where it's much more parallel and so that um, so everybody on the team is exactly at the same level and at exactly the same whatever it is and and um, and so that um, so each hives off their particular expertise you've assembled the team because one person's a quantitative methodologist one person's a qualitative methodologist one person's a content expert and so on and so I so I think that um, there are also I, I haven't seen a good publication on this, the writing on writing, but the assembly of a team and the five different kinds of team that you can have in a scholarly publication, I think, are, is, a, is a very, very interesting phenomenon and, um, and, and really should be explored more. Yeah, and I, and I would just add in um, some journals, not all, but some when they ask you for verification, certification of authorship and contribution, will actually also have you check the boxes where you are a contributor. Anything from an expert content person to I wrote the manuscript to I was the reviewer at the end or statistical help. And they almost have you bucket also with a checkbox what you did. Um, so, but I agree it's different pieces that of the team that bring together the real exciting whole. Um, Ed, um, how did, I'm gonna just go back one step. A long project, multiple sites that you were um, working with, colleagues from across the nation, how did you keep it going? And was there a period of regular meetings, um, you know, especially as it started getting toward the end when the data started coming together? Yeah, uh, again, over time, it was hard to keep people together in terms of regular meetings, but in semi-regular updates, I would get them on and ask advice or seek, seek their expertise. Um, again, different parts of the project required different amounts of contact with different people. One of the things is we had some decent statistical expertise in our, in our everyday team, but we realized that if you want to talk about professionalism and its role in a sophisticated way, and when you have a lot of data and a lot of factors that can predict it, you wanted to do a prediction model. And there was a guy at the School of Public Health who was a young world leader in prediction models for health 
we brought him on because this was an area that he had never played in and he loved the idea of applying his skills. On the other hand, we had no control over him. He, was, he lived on soft money, was in different countries half of the year and uh, had to be run after. So there was no way of even getting him to respond. When he responded, he was spectacular. But when he didn't, it was very frustrating and it drew things over a longer time. But eventually everybody came together and I really think that offered input into a final manuscript that made it a good one. And your, your article had the biggest authorship, just in sheer numbers. Did you know or plan how that authorship list would occur uh, you know, a priori or did that come about later in the process? Um, there was some discussion about how it would happen. We actually had one person who in an initial list uh, wrote to me privately and said, gee, I thought I would deserve a little higher than that person. Um, and we, we negotiated that. Uh, unfortunately, one of our authors, who was the former head of the uh, Promotions and Review Board, died shortly before publication. It, yeah. was, it was the most unusual experience I ever had. And we wrote a little dedication to him for all his hard work. Yeah. Let's, um, let's move to kind of this last piece. And uh, Christina, you were saying earlier, so I'm going to come back to you on this, um, what it was like to finally submit and then to get back a response. Um, so. A general question to you first, Christina, which is when you've submitted many articles over time, how often, how often do they come back with, um, we are interested, but um, please respond to all, or we may be interested, uh, please respond to all reviewers' comments. How often does that happen? Um, I think I've been pretty lucky. A good deal of my manuscripts have gotten what I would call major revisions. Um, Although I will say it's not unusual to just flat out get rejected by by one or two journals. I mean, if, if this happens to you, you should not feel bad because, you know, maybe it wasn't a great fit. In fact, my thesis uh, got rejected by a, a big name journal first first time, but then it got published in the Journal of Graduate Medical Education, which, which was a better fit for the journal. Um, but it can vary. I mean, I've, I've had up to probably five rejections before publications, and I've also gotten it in the first journal. But if you get a major revision, that, that is just par for the course, I think, at least in my experience. Dr. Puches, world-renowned medical educator, have you ever had an article rejected before? Yes. <laughs> well, yeah, yes, of course. And the, um, and, but with, I'm, a, I'm the deputy, I'm a deputy editor at medical education. And so that I've, um, and Ed's got editorial experience as well and of being on the other side of the fence. And, um, and so that uh, it would be uncommon to, to get an acceptance on the first go round that, uh, that really doesn't have much to say on your paper. And, um, but the, but, you know, Christina mentioned the growth mindset in the, in the chat. I, I think that as you go through it, the, the junior person response to this thing is, uh, you know, at a time where you're insecure about your own place in scholarship, is to take it personally, is to think about it as reflecting somehow on your worth as a scholar. And so you really, you know, I, I can remember the emotions of it. And, and we still, a lot of experienced people have their little rituals around the response to reviewer coming in, and they scan it, and then set it aside in an envelope or a metaphorical um, drawer so that they can soak that in for a bit and let the emotions wash away and then a week later or two weeks later then start the work of meticulously going through it. But I think you know sort of as you as you move for, move in your career and certainly as you get onto the editorial side you really recognize the fact that a peer review works. It seems random, it seems haphazard, it seems emotional, it seems personal, and, and you often get reviewer two is this great meme on Twitter right now where, where they, uh, Christina can describe it better than I can, but it's that cranky reviewer who, who just from the get-go thinks your thing is bad and then, and then you know, kind of uh, uh, can't find any reasons it's bad, but still, still brings things forward. And so, but, um, 
but I, but that notwithstanding, you know, when your when your paper goes to a top flight journal, I often submit to journals where I think it will get rejected, but I'm hopeful for a review. And so that when we were starting out and we we're starting out in quantitative methods and we didn't feel secure about our methods, we would send it to Jeff Norman's journal. And uh, Jeff Norman's journal is Advances in Health Sciences Education, but he's a physicist and he's a quant to the to the nth degree. And so that um, so we would send our idea over to him and it would get slaughtered by Jeff Norman. But we would pick through each of those things and go off and read about that and go off and read about that and then fire him back an email saying, hey, you said this, but we can't find any evidence for that and have a dialogue along those lines. And so that, um, so, uh, so I just point out that peer review works, that, that the peop that there are people on the other side of that peer review and they want the science to be good. And, and so you're embarking on a journey that, um, that I think in the end is, is great. Yeah. And I, I certainly, my mindset is always the same, which is I, I think after you put in some time and, a lot of time into an article, I think it's appropriate to think it totally belongs in that high level journal. And so if you don't shoot a little bit high, um, you know, you're probably also missing out on that one in three chance that, that you'll get into that really special place that you wanted. So um, part and parcel. And I, I think the other piece of advice that was given to me by a colleague um, or 20 years ago, a young colleague, just a friend at the time, who when I got rejected or like three times on one article looked at me and said, Every manuscript has a home. We just need to find the home. That's all. <laughs> so it will all find its way. But Ed, maybe you can comment on the review response that you got to your submission and um, how it kind of ultimately led to getting it fully published. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll reiterate <clears throat> what Martin and Christina have said, and that is that uh, <clears throat> reviews come in all shapes and sizes. Some are long, some are short, some are fair, some are unfair, some are sophisticated, some are detail oriented. We got back uh, using this very sophisticated guy. The problem we had not considered of heteroskedasticity. <laughs> now, if you think I knew what heteroskedasticity was, and when I went to our expert, he said, yeah, I know what that is. Let me look it up some more. But we had to go back and do some more tests. And it threw doubt on, on the very basis of our findings. And if it threw doubt on the basis of our findings, then in fact, it threw, threw us back into questioning how we interpreted the findings. So uh, the review process works. Sometimes it seems fair. Sometimes it doesn't seem fair. Sometimes the reviewers are sharp as a tack. Other times, I will admit, not so. Uh, but in general, uh, it is rare that you get rejected because of a silly or irrelevant reason. Uh, for the most part, it works. And it leads you, I mean, I think I've always said, the paper that got published was always better than the paper that got submitted. Yeah. Let me, uh, time is getting away from us. Dominique, let's stop and see uh, as we've done here. Any questions popping up in the chat? Yes, there's a really good question from Danielle about how to choose which, which journal to send your research and how is the process of submitting it? Christina. So uh, this is interesting to me. I always try to think about what the team recommends, whatever team I'm on. This particular publication, um, actually, the, the way that I submit, I chose this journal, they reached out to me. Um, it's an open access journal. Normally, I would not submit here because I don't have the funding to cover the article, but they got a new co-editor in chief and he read one of my prior articles about journal clubs and reached out. And normally, I would think that maybe it's a scam or they're just trying to get my money, but they said they would waive the fees if I submitted my paper, it went through their entire normal peer review and if ultimately it was accepted. And so I took that opportunity to publish in a new journal. So for me, this was a unique experience that I have never had before and I may never had again. Um, and I may have submitted there and it could have totally got rejected and then I would have had to think about other journals. But I will tell you, Danielle, um, you know, learn about the journals, go to every journal's website, read what their scope is, read through their sub author submission guidelines um, because I've had people say, oh, well, let's submit here. And I'm thinking to myself, that doesn't seem in line with this paper. And what you're 
technically doing is could be wasting time by not submitting to an aligned journal. And I think that's where we can all uh, rely on some of our mentors a little bit as well. Yeah. I just want to kind of um, bring some conclusions, give each of the panelists here also maybe a last word or thought that um, if they'd like to share. Um, hopefully this was useful. The real goal here was to take totally diverse and different scholarly products uh, that uh, were actively published in the last year. These are all fresh, right? Um, and to really see the behind the scenes a little bit, of uh, how, um, how it moves forward and, uh, and the ideas from the start, the, the mix of, of playing it out in the middle and then the uh, final push to get it actually uh, finally out there. Uh, and with and so to thank everyone for joining us, I also just want to kind of go around my my Zoom box here. And Ed, any last thoughts or comments that you might make? You know, it works and it's worth the effort. And if you get into it, it's not just for promotion and tenure or whatever, but you really feel like you're making a contribution. And it's if I can describe it as fun. Yeah. And once it's out there, it's out there forever. You're indexed forever, right? It's fun of it. Christina, last thoughts. Yeah, I would say don't be afraid of publishing your scholarly work. If you're going to put the time and effort into writing a paper, do everything you can to get that published, even if it ends up being a journal that maybe you don't read as often or maybe you don't view as, um, as, as high up as some other journals. It's still published. It's there forever, and it's something to be proud of. Another thing I personally um, recommend to people, you know, before you submit to a journal, make sure someone else has read it. Find a mentor not on the project. Find a peer in your program, find a colleague down the hallway and ask them if they'll pre-peer review it for you. Get their thoughts, get their comments, integrate them because your goal really is to submit to the journal and get the journal to review it as Martin said. So don't be afraid to let people read your work and help you improve it because that's your goal in the long term. And Martin, last to you. Right. Um, I would return to the idea that different journals do different things in our field. And so that, um, so consult us and we can help you with, um, with making that, uh, making that call. JGME has an audience of residency program directors. So if you want them to see it, go to them. If you want the deans of medical schools to see it, go to academic medicine. If you want quantitative researchers, go to advances in health sciences. If you want to tackle education theory, Theory, then medical education is is the place to go and um, and there's a number of other journals that you can go on the list but the but the point being that there you know as um, as Eric said every every article can find a home and so that um, but you need advice and that's that's that informal curriculum of education uh, scholarship that um, that uh, that you need to talk to people about well, a special thanks to my three panelists, Dominique, a special thanks to you for monitoring the chat and EE and the BEI team behind the scenes. It takes a lot to pull this off, but uh, what a joy to get everyone virtually together uh, and also invite you to everything we have upcoming. Follow us on Twitter uh, and be a part of the community. So with that, I thank everyone. I hope you have a great day ahead and uh, appreciate all your comments or feedback that you can send. Thank you again. Mm -hmm.